I'm Alan Fenn at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and this is lecture number four, Moment Method Analysis of Focused Near Field Adaptive Nulling. It's part of the lecture series Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays. Here's the course content breakdown by topic for this lecture, number four. We're going to be covering adaptive antenna theory in the context of jammer nulling. We'll include some phased array theory. This would be considered an antenna measurement technique. We'll be analyzing array mutual coupling in this lecture for both far field and near field characteristics. The book Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays for Radar and Communications contains a great deal of information related to this lecture, and you could refer to that for more information. So the purpose of this lecture is to describe a focused near field adaptive nulling technique. This was discussed in lecture number three, and it's a technique that would be used to evaluate the far field performance of an adaptive phased array antenna. In lecture three, the analysis did not include array mutual coupling effects, which will now be included in this lecture. Here's an outline of the talk. After a brief introduction and background, I'll describe the theory used in analyzing adaptive phased arrays using array mutual coupling effects. Then we'll show some results for a linear array with single and multiple jammers under near field and far field conditions, and then we'll summarize. So by way of introduction, adaptive antenna systems have been explored extensively by numerous researchers since the 1950s. The primary functions of an adaptive antenna system are to minimize interference and jamming, to suppress radar clutter, and to detect radar targets. So in the diagram shown in the lower left, we're going to analyze an adaptive phased array antenna with single and multiple jammers under near field and far field conditions. So in this lecture we're going to be analyzing array mutual coupling effects for the antenna and we'll be discussing some signal processing used to null out the jamming. So here are some adaptive array testing considerations. Large aperture adaptive arrays with multiple widely distributed interference sources can be difficult to test. The reason for that is if you try to establish far field conditions for a large aperture, you require a very large range distance. The far field range distance is typically given as r equal to l squared over lambda, where l is the aperture length, and lambda is the wavelength. So if we have a very large aperture, say 20 meters at 1 gigahertz, then the range distance is around 2.7 kilometers. If we go up to 10 gigahertz for the same aperture size, the range distance for the far field is 27 kilometers. And if we require multiple interferers or multiple jammers, then we need a huge far field range to evaluate the performance of this large adaptive antenna system. So an alternate test configuration that reduces the test distance from the far field region down to the near field region would be very desirable. And we'll show how that's done. First, let's compare and show the contrast between a far field source and a near field source. A far field source located a large distance away from an adaptive antenna aperture would have a plane wave field incident on the aperture. A near field source located close to the adaptive antenna would have a spherical wave front impinging on the array aperture. So in lecture three, we showed that the near field and far field dispersion or time delay across an aperture is a function of the source incidence angle and the near field range distance. So that's shown here. Beta is the dispersion multiplier. Alpha is the F over L ratio, where F is the focal distance and L is the array length, shown in this diagram. And so for a range distance of infinity, the far field dispersion multiplier follows a cosine curve. 
And we see that once we're between one and two aperture diameters from this aperture L, that the dispersion multiplier is very similar to the far field. And once we get down to about a half an aperture diameter, we do see some significant differences between a near field source and a far field source in terms of the dispersion multiplier. So we would conclude and say that the near field dispersion is approximately equal to the far field wavefront dispersion when the source distance is about one to two aperture diameters from the adaptive array antenna under test. Now to take this one step further, let's suppose we have this large phased array antenna, which is adaptive, and we have weights that are used to steer the main beam in some direction. Most phased arrays would have that equipment. There'd be a summing junction or a combiner, so we could form a main channel output from a large phased array antenna. Now to make it adaptive, we would tap off of auxiliary channels, signals, and then weight them with an adaptive set of weights forming an adaptive array output. Now what we'd like to do is establish a near field test plane located some distance away from the aperture but very close, one to two aperture diameters away. We can place a CW calibration source at the desired focal point of the array. We can transmit from that source, receive from the array, and correct the phase shifting in the array modules to focus the beam in the near field. And this was shown in lecture three. Having established now a focused near field pattern with a main beam and side lobes, we can now introduce interferers on the side lobes of this pattern. One of the reasons for using a near field test plane as shown here is that for conventional planar near field scanning of large phased array apertures, this type of equipment already exists and we may be able to use it or modify it to do near field adaptive nulling. So to summarize, this technique allows real-time measurements of adaptive nulling performance. The technique is real-time because we use the phase shifters in the array to steer the main beam in a direction with side lobes away from the main beam. This is done in real-time. We can introduce interferers that are radiating in real time and then go through the adaptive nulling process using real-time software and hardware to null out the jamming. And this can be done in an anechoic chamber. Now this diagram shows near field test plane and focal distance. And the point I'd like to make in this diagram is that what we'd like to do is stay as close to the aperture as possible. D sub x is the length of the focal plane where we're distributing calibration sources, jamming sources, clutter sources, for example, and target sources. So if the array has length L, this equation shown here, the total length required for the focused near field adaptive nulling testing is twice the aperture length times the F over L ratio times tangent of theta max, where theta max is the maximum angle away from broadside. So the near field test plane dimensions depends on the field of view and the focal range. This diagram shows two types of adaptive arrays, the fully and partially adaptive arrays. A fully adaptive array would have a weight control at every antenna element so that all array elements contribute to the adaptive nulling process. In a partially adaptive array, which is going to be explored in this lecture, We've got a phased array antenna with a number of weights, amplitude and phase weights, forming a main channel. And then we're tapping off from several elements to form auxiliary channels. And so the adaptive beam former takes the main channel array output and weights the auxiliary channels such that we can null the interference at the output of the beam former. So for the partially adaptive array, some array elements contribute to the adaptive nulling process. And so we're going to show an example in this lecture of a partially adaptive array under near field and far field conditions. This slide shows a receiver array with mutual coupling effects taken into account using the method of moments.
The diagram on the left shows an array antenna with a receiver at each of the antenna elements. And what we want to do is calculate, in this case, the received signal or received voltage at each of these antenna elements in the array. So the nth and nth array elements can be characterized using mutual coupling by the open circuit mutual impedance element, ZMN. If we have a near field source, we can also quantify the coupling between the source and the array by the open circuit mutual impedance element, ZNJ, where J is the nth near field source. We can do this for a number of sources. So VNJ is the desired voltage received by the nth array element due to the J source. INJ is the received terminal current for the nth element due to the J source. In chapter 4 of the book, it is shown that the voltage matrix for the jth transmitting jamming source is equal to the load impedance times the inverse of the summation of the open circuit impedance matrix between all the array elements plus the load impedance times the identity matrix. This quantity or this matrix is then multiplied times the open circuit voltage matrix due to the jth radiating near field source. So this is how we take into account mutual coupling effects. And the same formulation can apply to the far field as well. Now the covariance matrix elements for either near field or far field interference is described here. This is the same description as in lecture three. The cross correlation RMN of the received voltages in the mth and nth adaptive channels is given by the expected value of the product of the voltage in the mth element times the conjugate of the voltage in the nth element. We can also express RMN as a frequency average as 1 over the bandwidth times the integral over the nulling bandwidth of the product of Vm as a function of frequency times Vn conjugate as a function of frequency df. So in this expression, the quantity Vm of f, or Vn of f, takes into account the wavefront shape, which can be either spherical in the near field case, or can be planar in the far field interference case. This slide shows how to calculate the covariance matrix when there are multiple interference sources. So if there are J uncorrelated interference sources, then the overall covariance matrix R is a summation of the covariance matrices for the individual sources as shown here. And then we're adding in the identity matrix to represent thermal noise of the adaptive nulling receiver. This slide shows how to compute the adaptive weight vector. So prior to generating an adaptive null, the adaptive channel weight vector W is chosen to synthesize a desired quiescent radiation pattern. And when interference is present, the optimum set of nulling weights, which is given by W sub A, to form an adaptive null is computed by the matrix W sub A as shown here. W A is equal to the inverse of the covariance matrix, which was described in the previous slide, times the quiescent weight vector. Now to compute the array output power and interference noise ratio, what we need to do is compute the expected or mean value of the adaptive array output power as shown here which essentially is equal to the weight conjugate transpose times the covariance matrix times the weight vector. And then the interference to noise ratio can be computed from the ratio of the output power with the interferer present to the output power with only receiver noise present. So the INR is given by this expression shown here, weight conjugate transpose times the covariance matrix times the weight vector divided by weight conjugate transpose times the weight vector. Finally, the adaptive array cancellation ratio can be calculated by taking the ratio of the output power before adaption to the output power after adaption, P sub Q divided by P sub A. So the cancellation is given by the following expression, 
the quiescent weight vector conjugate transpose times the covariance matrix times the quiescent weight vector divided by the adapted weight vector conjugate transpose times the covariance matrix times the adapted weight vector. The covariance matrix eigenvalues represent the adaptive array degrees of freedom consumed in the nulling process. And to show equivalence between the focus near field and focus far field cases, we need to compare the covariance matrix eigenvalues. So the covariance matrix R has n eigenvalues and n eigenvectors, given by this expression shown here. By the spectral theorem, the covariance matrix, which is Hermitian, can be decomposed in eigenspace as shown by this summation. Lambda sub k is the kth eigenvalue, and E sub k is the kth eigenvector. Now since the covariance matrix is Hermitian, the eigenvalues are real, and the sum of the diagonal entries of the covariance matrix is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are proportional to power and represent the degrees of freedom that are consumed in the adaptive nulling process. Let's show some results. In the adaptive array simulation shown here, we will be investigating a 32 element partially adaptive linear array of monopole elements spaced in one half wavelength intervals at 1.3 gigahertz. We'll use three auxiliary nulling channels to null out the interference. We take into account array mutual coupling by the formulation shown earlier for the method of moments. We will analyze single and multiple jammers for both near field and far field cases. We'll show radiation patterns before and after adaption and also the adaptive cancellation covariance matrix eigenvalues, and adaptive array weights. Here's the array that's being simulated. We have a 32 element linear array of monopole radiators surrounded with three auxiliary channels. The active receiver array is embedded in a larger array such, such that we have two rows of passively terminated elements surrounding the active array. This is a technique commonly done for phased arrays to avoid ground plane edge effects. In this analysis, we're going to assume an infinite ground plane. Now, to design a monopole array, you can refer to lecture number 9, or book chapter 9. So in the near field nulling case, we're going to have a dipole source polarized in the x direction. The monopoles are oriented in the z direction. So there are 32 elements in the linear array surrounded with terminated elements, and there are three auxiliary monopole elements, aux1, aux2, and aux3. Now to compute near field radiation patterns, this dipole source shown here will be moved along a line in front of the array and to compensate for the probe pattern, we use the expression shown here. We compute the voltage received by the array and divide by the radiation pattern of the dipole probe, which produces the near field pattern. And P sub theta of theta is shown here. This is the equation for the far field radiation pattern of a dipole source. Let's now show single jammer simulations for both focus near field and focus far field interference. This slide shows radiation patterns before and after nulling for far field and near field interference. On the left we show the results before nulling and on the right we show the results after nulling. So before nulling we're showing two cases where the focal range is 1.5 aperture diameters or two aperture diameters. So near, the near field simulations are the dash curve and the solid curve is the far field simulation. The array length is 3.39 meters. So we generally see good agreement between the focus near field patterns and focus far field patterns, with the exception of the first side lobes, which in this case, since we've assumed a 40 dB low side lobe chubby chef pattern, there is some degradation in the near in side lobes. And this degradation increases as we move in toward the antenna. Here we're at one and a half aperture diameters compared to two.
we also see that the monopole element null is being filled in in the vicinity of broadside. On the right, we introduce a single near field interferer at an angle 40 degrees from broadside. We assume 1 megahertz of nulling bandwidth. And we do see that for both focus near field and focus far field cases, that the interferer or jammer has been nulled. There are some differences in the pattern, but they're not considered significant in terms of near field nulling or far field nulling. So we can conclude that based on radiation patterns, that near field and far field patterns are nearly equivalent in the adaptive nulling sense. This slide shows the adaptive cancellation for the single jammer with 1 megahertz of nulling bandwidth. So again, it's a 32 element monopole array with three auxiliary elements with mutual coupling. And we show three near field cases where we focused at one aperture diameter, 1.5 aperture diameters, and two aperture diameters. And the jammer is located at 40 degrees from broadside. And then we have the far field case as well. So before nulling, the interference to noise ratio is 50 dB in each case. After adaption, since there are sufficient degrees of freedom and we've nulled the interference, the INR is 0 dB after adaption in all cases, which means the cancellation is 50 dB in every case. And therefore, we can conclude that the adaptive cancellation is equivalent for focused near field nulling and focused far field nulling. This slide shows the two-dimensional radiation pattern after adaptive nulling at a range distance of two aperture diameters. So if we've gone through the process of nulling an interference source with a 32 element array and three auxiliary elements, including array mutual coupling effects, once we've done that, if we sample the near field radiation pattern on an XY plane parallel to the array, we do see a near field null, a two dimensional null formed at the position of the interferer. Let's now compute the covariance matrix eigenvalues for this example for near field and far field interference. For the 32 element array with three auxiliary elements and with mutual coupling. So the single interferer is located at 40 degrees from broadside. And since we have a main channel and three auxiliary channels, we have a four by four covariance matrix and there are four eigenvalues for this covariance matrix. So the eigenvalues are plotted here for focus near field and focus far field cases. And we see very good agreement over a large dynamic range. The maximum eigenvalue is about 80 dB. There's an intermediate eigenvalue in the range of about 30 to 40 dB. And this is due to the finite bandwidth and the size of the array. Eigenvalues 3 and 4 are at the noise level for both near field and far field cases. So we can conclude that the eigenvalues are nearly equal for near field and far field interference. Now let's show the adaptive array weights for the focus near field and focus far field cases. Again, it's a 32 element array with three auxiliary elements with mutual coupling. So with the main channel and three auxiliary elements, there are four adaptive weights. So the main channel is set to 0 dB, and that's, that's channel 1. Channel 2, 3, and 4 are the auxiliary elements, or auxiliary weights. And we can see that the near field and far field cases are very, very similar. The weights are set to around minus 35 dB down from the main channel setting. And so we can conclude that the adaptive array weights are nearly equal for focus near field and focus far field interference cases. Now let's show the case of multiple jammers. This slide shows the adaptive radiation patterns for the case of two jammers. So we have a 32 element monopole array with three auxiliary elements spread across the array. We're including the array mutual coupling effects. The two jammers are located at 42 degrees and 47 degrees from broadside. So here we show the adaptive array patterns for both the focus near field cases and focus far field cases. The near field cases correspond to a focal distance of 1.5 aperture diameters and two aperture diameters.
We do see very good agreement between the focus near field and focus far field cases. Uh, there are nulls formed in the direction of the interference sources for both focus far field and focus near field cases. So we can summarize and say that the near field and far field patterns are nearly equivalent when we compare focus near field nulling with focus far field nulling. This slide shows the calculated adaptive cancellation for two jammers at fixed positions where we vary the bandwidth of the nulling system. So it's a 32 element array with three auxiliary elements with mutual coupling effects. The two jammers are located at 42 degrees and 47 degrees from broadside. They have equal power. The total interference power before nulling is 50 dB above noise. So we're showing four curves. We have the case where the interference is at infinity, so it be the far field case. And then we have three near field cases where the focal length is one, one and a half, and two aperture diameters. And so the cancellation tracks very well over a very wide bandwidth, going up to 100 megahertz of nulling bandwidth. The adaptive cancellation varies from 50 dB for narrow band down to about 20 dB or a little less for a case of 100 megahertz of nulling bandwidth. And we do see very good agreement between the focus near field and focus far field cases. There is more degradation as you move closer and closer to the array. But in the range of about one to two aperture diameters, there's generally good agreement between focus far field and focus near field cases. With the best agreement being when we're close to about two aperture diameters. So we can conclude that the adaptive cancellation is equivalent for near field and far field cases once the near field distance increases to about two aperture diameters. This slide shows the covariance matrix eigenvalues for the case of two jammers. We have a 32 element monopole array with three auxiliary elements and we're including mutual coupling effects. The two jammers are located at 42 degrees and 47 degrees from broadside. So the diagram on the upper left are the two covariance matrix eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2 as a function of nulling bandwidth from 1 megahertz to 100 megahertz of nulling bandwidth. The diagram on the lower left is for eigenvalues 3 and 4. And so we see that over a very large dynamic range that the near field and far field eigenvalues track very well. So in other words, the degrees of freedom are consumed approximately the same when we include mutual coupling effects and multiple jammers. So in conclusion, the eigenvalues are nearly equal for near field and far field interference when we use the focus near field adaptive nulling technique. This slide shows the adaptive array weights for the case of two jammers in the field of view of the 32 element monopole array with three auxiliary elements where we're taking into account array mutual coupling effects. So with two jammers at 42 and 47 degrees from broadside and a fixed 100 megahertz of nulling bandwidth, here we're plotting the adaptive array weights. So weight number one is the main channel weighting, which is 0 dB. And weights 2, 3, and 4 are the auxiliary weights. And what we do see is that as we move from one aperture diameter to two aperture diameters, that the nulling weights are approximating the far field nulling weights. And so for the case of two aperture diameters, we have very good agreement between focus near field and focus far field nulling weights. There are some differences at one and a half and one aperture diameters, but they're not large. So in, in summary, we can say that adaptive array weights are nearly equal for near field and far field interference at a near field test distance of about two aperture diameters. So let's summarize. The focus near field adaptive nulling technique, which was introduced in lecture three, has been further explored in this lecture where we've now included the effects of mutual coupling. We've shown an equivalence between focus near field and focus far field adaptive nulling when we take into account mutual coupling. In terms of the radiation patterns, covariance matrix eigenvalues, which are the array degrees of freedom, we've shown equivalence in cancellation and adaptive array weights for both near field and far field cases.
Here's a reference for this lecture, the book, Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays for Radar and Communications, has derivations and more information related to this lecture.